Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, just to let everyone know that we have moved this event into the largest venue we have here at La Boite. So please feel free to spread yourselves across this Roundhouse Theatre if you feel uncomfortable about gathering too closely. But welcome to the COVID-19 briefing for the performing arts industry here at La Boite today, Tuesday the 17th at four o'clock. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I work, live and raise my family, the Turrbal and the Yagara peoples, the land in which we are gathered here today. I'd also like to acknowledge the many people joining us on live stream today who are listening in from the many First Nations countries across this continent and acknowledge all elders past, present, emerging and those with us today. This COVID-19 performing arts sector briefing was initiated by a number of Brisbane arts leaders. And I would like to thank all of those that have offered their time and knowledge to today's event. This session is specifically for independent artists and small to medium companies. I'd also like to acknowledge that the evolving COVID-19 impact on the performing arts sector is devastating. In Australia alone, so far we have seen recorded nearly $50 million of lost income, 190,000 lost jobs, and 20,000 events cancelled, and more every day. This briefing is an opportunity to hear from colleagues working very hard on behalf of this sector in advocacy as we try and navigate a crisis with no time frame and no confirmed industry package. This afternoon session is focused on survival and transition and hope. You will be hearing from Wendy Ware, Executive Director, Strategic Development and Advocacy at the Australia Council for the Arts. John Kotsis, CEO of QPAC and Vice President of LPA, who is running a bit late as he is at the coalface on a phone call at QPAC and will be joining us as soon as he can. Michelle Ray, MEAA Director, Queensland Branch. Paul Dellett, from, who's the President of the Actors and Entertainers Benevolent Fund, as well as Tanya Hall, Acting Executive Director of Policy and Programs from Arts Queensland. This will then be followed for 10 minutes or so for questions that will be specifically focused on clarification that you might want from these speakers. And then what we are hoping for is a facilitated 30-minute brainstorm focused on ideas, suggestions, and possible solutions within our power as a whole sector. We'll be taking questions from the floor, as well as some of them that will be coming through via our Facebook feed. So we will do our best to allow people to be heard. Please have patience with us. We also need to remember that we may not be able to resolve individual issues, but we can discuss how we come together. I would also like to acknowledge Mike Webb, our Auslan interpreter, who will be here with us today and this afternoon. Sandra Fields, who will be facilitating the final section of the session, and Charlie Cush, CEO of Brisbane Festival, who will be assisting. Please know that we will be taking minutes and notes and we will make them available with links to helpful resources after this event. So let's get started. I'd like to first hear and welcome Wendy Ware from the Australia Council who will be joining us live on Zoom in the screen behind me. Thanks. Thanks Zoha and um, congratulations to everyone involved for organising this meeting. It's such an important thing to do at the moment because information is flying so fast and so quickly. So I've been asked to give you all an update on what's happening with the Australia Council right now. And I just want to echo what Zoha said, which is artists, organisations, venues, galleries and communities are being significantly impacted in the short term. Um, and we also know that even now, after a few days of, of um, venue closures, that we can expect much longer term effects. Uh, ours is an industry that relies very heavily on two principles of people being able to move and travel and people being able to gather. And when those, both of those things are so significantly compromised, we have a problem that emerges very, very quickly. And what's patently clear right now is that we don't have the luxury of much of a buffer. 
um, the data that's already coming through is, is pretty clear that even, and it's not just small organisations, it's large organisations, many of them have a very small window where we can sustain this kind of closure. Um, and a lot of organisations across the whole spectrum are at risk of folding in a matter of weeks unless immediate action is taken. Uh, like so many orgs, we have also at council been in a situation where we've needed to, we've needed to cancel and postpone many of our programs, um, and we anticipate further disruption to the ones that we're still hoping will go ahead. Um, and like me, I'm sure many of you have an inbox which is flooded with emails of cancellations and postponements, and I just keep coming through. Um, by the minutes. So we're all in uncharted territory and at the council we're working with industry, with the sector and with government to assess the impact of the pandemic on all of us working in the cultural and creative sector. Um, this includes financial impacts of course um, and uh, the impacts to organisations and also to artists' livelihoods as well as impacts to health and wellbeing which are inevitable um, with something like this. So many of you have been contributing to those sector surveys which have been rapidly popping up, um, whether it's Lost My Gig or uh, the PAC survey or the many others that are coming into the field. Um, please keep doing that because what we're doing at the Australia Council is working with the eyes of those surveys to collate all that data to get a big picture of what's happening in the cultural and creative industries and translating that into a clear narrative which with the evidence that provides the case for support um, and that's one of our immediate priorities in terms of advising government. We're also working with state governments um, to assess the immediate and midterm impacts on many of our co-funded organisations and we're working with the Office for the Arts and um, Mr Paul Fletcher as they consider what additional support can be made available um, to the cultural and creative sectors at this time. So on that, many of you saw the government's $17.6 billion package last week. It included cash flow assistance for small to medium and businesses to support them to continue to pay employees. And we know that's a real issue at the moment. Artists are not getting paid, particularly people who've, been, who've just watched that economy crash over the weekend. Um, there's up to a maximum of $25,000, and this assistance is available to eligible small to medium arts businesses. So if that's you, please look into that and please keep paying your artists. Um, many of you might be aware that this morning there was a round table uh, convened by our minister, Paul Fletcher, um, where significant and really detailed concerns were shared uh, from all areas of the sector, including peak bodies like LPA and AMPAG, TNA and NAVA, cultural institutions, libraries, museums, galleries, First Nations orgs, the whole lot, including Australia Council, um, and people representing individual artists as well, uh, producers, um, independent and individual artists. So the roundtable was called by the Minister to hear directly from the art sector about how they were dealing with the challenges they're facing immediately, um, but also to hear their suggestions for urgent and long-term support measures. So the key issues that came out of that, and no doubt LPA will, will have more to add to this, was there's a real need for a central um, and coordinated national approach. There's a lot of state-based uh, things that are happening um, and we need to, to get clarity on what is the national approach to the public health response to this virus, including when organisations and venues can anticipate potentially uh, resuming operations, because that's one of the challenges. There isn't a time frame at the moment, so people don't know what they're planning for. Um, there's the need for direct and immediate relief um, for those whose incomes have been immediately affected. So that's the individual artists, the freelancers, the contractors, the sole traders, everyone who is no longer drawing an income because of the cancellations. Um, and also support to ensure that the broader cultural infrastructure, the ecology of organisations is maintained through this so that when it's over, people can resume activities. Um, there are a number of, number of practical options put forward to feed into the whole of government planning um, and now at the Australia Council we're rapidly feeding the data um, and modelling that will help government hopefully uh, come to a position where they can make some quick decisions. Um, at the Council, we are identifying and implementing immediate actions we can take for those of you who have received funding from us for things that you can no longer do. Um, it might be international travel, it might be a range of activities that you are no longer able to deliver and for which you've received funding. Um, the kinds of things that we're putting in are around, are around flexibility for those things. So if you said you were going to do X, we will give you the opportunity to vary it to Y. And, um, 
we'll do a contract variation and you can continue with funds and then we'll um, work around that. We'll also look at flexibility around delivery. So if you said you were going to do an activity in a certain time frame, haven't been able to do it, um, we can extend those time frames and have flexibility in that. Um, and also looking at flexibility around uh, reporting and those sorts of requirements, which are part and parcel of receiving public money, but we can provide um, assistance through being much more flexible and um, extending those timeframes for when you need to submit those reports. So those are some immediate things that we are doing. Um, we are, and we'll communicate with everyone who's in that situation directly. So those conversations are already happening, but if you are in receipt of funding and need to do that, that's underway. And the one priority in coming months is to ensure that we come out of this um, intact and that we are able to resume activity once uh, the world returns to some sense of normality. Um, what that may mean is that we will need to potentially think through some of our existing funding programs in the short term to provide that immediate support, which is so desperately needed. We're working at speed on this right now, um, and we hope that we'll be in a position to communicate what, um, what that might look like in the coming days. Uh, if you haven't already seen it, flagging, there is a very detailed web resource on the Australian Council website. Uh, which has a whole raft of information, uh, both for you as an organisation, but for you as an individual, on how you could be responding to the challenges of COVID-19. Um, we are updating it daily. Uh, a lot of people are sharing really great resources um, with us from around the world. So it's a one-stop shop where you can go and, and sort of see what's happening locally and locally and get a sense of the kinds of things that you may be able to do to, um, to put yourself in the best possible situation. Um, so many people are really keenly feeling the lack of being, of, of having the opportunity for the cultural experiences. I know I called a friend of mine who works in banking today and said we're not going to the show on Wednesday because like so many other things, it's cancelled and she was devastated and her response was, I really needed something like that in my life right now. So we're thinking about ways which we can get arts experiences to people at a time of self-isolation and potential quarantine. Um, as an immediate action, we're creating new channels where content can be shared and we're about to, to put information about that um, out. Uh, and we have some longer term plans about ways that people might be able to distribute their activity uh, digitally. And so we can keep, keep um, those experiences going. So I guess I'm going to only have five minutes, so I'll stop there. But there's been so many reminders at this moment in time of how creativity connects us, whether it's Italians singing on balconies or this kind of public outpouring when major or even small events are cancelled. Um, so please look after each other. Um, stay in touch with your peak bodies and your advocacy group. They are such important channels for us right now and we're all working together on this um, and we will continue to put out more information through the Australia Council channels whether it's social or you know, digital or online um, as soon as we can. That's it from me Zoha. Thanks so much Wendy and um, as John just walked in I'll let him get uh, catch his breath and have a glass of water. Um, I really appreciate that update and if anyone has any questions for Wendy please save them for after these brief updates and you'll be able to ask them or we'll get to them later. Um, so I might just skip ahead and um, ask Michelle to give a bit of an update, a short one from MEAA and um, what you can share with the group here. Five minutes, thank you. <laughs> Please five minutes. Um, I think Wendy's covered a lot of the kind of organisational side of it. So Media Entertainment Arts Alliance is obviously the union for creatives, whether they're technicians or performers or creators of the, the art. And so realistically, from the Media Entertainment Arts Alliance point of view, for us, it's been about trying to give a voice to the individual workers. Um, and also ensuring that when we're talking to federal government, that that urgent support isn't just about organisational, which is very important because they are the employers, but also that we think about it from a real point, the workers' point. 2.5, uh, so approximately, uh, the bulk of our work is casuals. We are freelancers. We are um, casuals. We are gig to gig people. That means that something that has gone on like it just has, has a catastrophic event to what we can expect in our earnings. So what the voice that me has been trying to provide at the federal level and the state level is about 
how do we also support those that had an expectation of earnings? Um, as Wendy has said, the buffer isn't great. So at the first call, one of the things that we've been asking is that what we say the best practice looks like is where there has to be a shutdown, that we look at the best way of being able to pay those people who are expected on that wage. Because without our artists being paid, our economy ceases. We are a large proportion of it. Um, and also, not only that, when you look at all the websites and all the Facebook and all of the creative minds, we're actually really good at doing community at the same time. But we need to remember that the responsibility isn't just ours, it's also beyond us. Um, so obviously working with live performance, which I'm sure John will talk to in relation to the specific support for the arts and the entertainment industries. But the other one is that not all of our work is being shut down. Some, for some of us, there's still work happening. So it's also about ensuring that we have a two-way conversation between our workers and our employers about what are our best workplace health and safety practices. We're really lucky. We have a great public health system in this country that's guiding us about that. But we need to ensure that our workers are having the opportunity to have those conversations. So the live performance sector has obviously been heavily impacted right now. The screen industry, not as greatly. Um, that means there's work still going on in those areas, but those workers need to have voice about what their concerns might be to ensure, because at the end of the day, we, not wanna, we don't want just a safe workplace, but we want a safe community and we want people to be able to go home again. Um, one of the things that Wendy spoke to was about the cost of cancellation. The only way we are going to be able to build the story of what this has cost, what this means to individuals, what this means as a knock-on effect to our economy is by bringing it down to a grassroot level about what people are losing. So obviously, Wendy said there's lots of those different surveys. The MIA website has one to capture that for people. It's easy, just go mia.org and it will come up as the front page. I did something really old school today. I printed some copies. So if people want to fill them in paper form, you can come and see Nico and I from the office. Um, we didn't bring pens because, you know, we shouldn't share. So if you've got your own pens, that would be good. Um, the other, I think, best thing is that we need to work at all levels of government to ensure that our employers have the ability to pay people. It's not, we didn't ask for coronavirus as creatives to come to our country. We didn't ask for our industry to be so impacted. And so we need to make sure that we're supporting those asks and those calls from the employer groups that support people being paid. We're really lucky in Queensland at this point in time. I'm really proud of our community and our employers because right now, at this point in time, in this minute point in time, the effect of people, the effect on our individuals who were in paid employment hasn't been affected yet. But that can't be sustained because the buffer isn't big enough. Government needs to step up. We have to collectively ask. We know that the federal government took away us as a ministry in our own right. We were taken away. We're not even in the ministry name anymore. They need to remember that this is the most important part. You tell the stories of this country every day. You are the culture of this country and our work is important. And just like the Italian singing is about proving the importance of the creative arts, if this progresses, our storytelling will be the important part of this and that needs to be reminded. This is our opportunity to actually enforce across our communities that arts matters. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, and please do see Michelle and Nico with your own pen after the session and, and fill in the survey. Um, now, John, I think you've caught your breath, hopefully. Um, I'm just hoping for a five-minute update. It's been a big day in the world of LPA. But um, just a bit of an overview about where things are at. Sure. Um, thanks, everybody. Sorry I'm um, late. Um, I'm wearing two hats today, but today I'll just wear my LPA one this afternoon. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Cotsis. Um, I'm one of the vice presidents of Live Performance Australia. L LPA is the peak industry body, um, and it's kind of seen as the employer body. Um, but I just want to back up a couple of things that Michelle is talking about. This is where, where uh, we are all working together. It's LPA and MEAA working together. Um, there will be no sector if we don't work together. So if I can just give you a bit of a background to what happened since Friday afternoon, because it's really important to see that there was a change. This escalated pretty quickly. 
Um, LPA had been lobbying the government to go, this is coming, what are you doing about it? And then on Friday afternoon, I think we got all caught by surprise when the Prime Minister came out and give a, didn't give a directive, but essentially made some recommendations. And from um, a whole range of issues, for a whole range of issues, that sent us all into mad panic because um, the recommendation was not a directive and so consequently a whole lot of people's insurance went into um, craziness. Right? And without those insurances, we kind of need income coming in to be able to sustain the economy. So over the weekend, there's been, there was a hell of a lot of lobbying going on to federal arts ministers and to state premiers to say, when you meet on Sunday afternoon, we need you to be much clearer in terms of the, um, the impact that it's going to have on our industry and our sector as we work together. And I think by Sunday afternoon, you saw that. So uh, there's a whole lot of um, theatres now going through the process of closing. And if you look at the number of states that they're going, I think we saw Victoria, then we saw New South Wales. Um, you'll hear shortly Western Australia and then South Australia. And last of all, it'll be Queensland. I suspect that that's the way it's going to go. Um, I think that's what's happened to, to this point in time. In the background, there's a whole lot of conversations going on with the big promoters and the small promoters to see how we can actually preserve those performances at another time. Um, I would really encourage you, if, if you're not a member of LPA and you find yourself in an employer body, in an employment situation, actually go and ring LPA and ask for advice. They can give you strong ad advice. The other part of that is the ticketing code of conduct in terms of the most important thing that we do through all of this is that between everyone who works in our sector that we maintain the trust between the companies and the artists and between those two groups and the audience. And so um, there's a whole range of um, conversations happening with audiences about postponements and cancellations and refunds. Um, I'll just leave it at that and take questions later. That's really wonderful. Thank you so much. And as we said at the top of this, this is about how we come together as a sector um, and how we found, find positive solutions to move us forward through this very unknown next stage. So next up, I'd really like to hear from Paul Dellert, who is representing the Artist and Entertainers Benevolent Fund. Um, for those of you who are streaming online and are visiting us and joining us from um, other states, uh, there are funds set up in each of your state. This update, as well as Tanya Hall from Arts Queensland, before we get into the Q&A and the strategy session, will be Queensland-centric. So I ask that you please inquire directly with your state office, but you may very well enjoy hearing this update. So, Paul. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Dellert. I'm the president of the Actors and Entertainers Benevolent Fund of Queensland, a registered charity in uh, Australia for over 45 years, and I've been involved with the fund for about 30 years. The premise of the fund is that we started um, in Australia, every, as Zohar said, every state has its own fund. Um, ours was started in 1975 by Alan Edwards when he was the um, artistic director of Queensland Theatre. And since then, we have supported hundreds of performers in times of dire circumstance. And that's what we do. We, we, there couldn't be any more dire circumstance than what is happening at the moment. Um, we are primarily a small um, fund, but we are a diligent fund that is run by a um, volunteer committee. And uh, we probably, we raise, we're in a good position because we raise more money each year than we actually give away. And if it wasn't for supporters like uh, QPAC and La Boite and Queensland Theatre and Shake and Stir and the Gordon Frost <laughs> Organisation and Opera Queensland, uh, they're the ones that allow us access to their audiences for our primary way that we raise um, funds, which is through bucket collections. And um, of, of course, in the last four or five months, with bushfires and droughts, etc., we haven't been able to access a lot of audiences because audiences have been focused on and production has been focused on supporting the bushfires. So where we normally support um, actors in Brisbane or in Queensland to the tune of about $50,000 a year, which uh, sounds like a lot, and then might not sound like a lot. But for the size of our fund, it certainly is a lot. We are not, um, you know, we, we are a very healthy fund, as I said, but we certainly don't have unlimited means. Um, one of the things... Um, as I've been contacted by many people over the last few days, um, in particular some in high profile industry people, including um, Catherine Lyle Watson and Nellie Lee and Naomi Price, about what the fund can do and how can they help the fund to assist performance.
performers in need uh, during this time. So uh, tomorrow we're going to be uh, discussing uh, at a, a, a sort of an urgent um, committee meeting what we can do. We have a, a website that uh, already has a portal to for people to donate to. We, as I said, we are a charity, so it's a tax deduct we have tax deductibility. We'll be launching a major fundraising campaign to raise anything between fifty to a hundred thousand um, dollars, and with the help of uh, a great PR agency, hopefully we'll be able to uh, get that word out. We uh, we've, we've we've raised money before as a, on Facebook as well, but Facebook takes quite a while to uh, deliver the money. And what we don't want is we don't want a whole lot of individuals going off and trying to raise money um, when we could be doing something major. Um, so that's what we're, we're trying to do. There's different different things have been set up all around the world to do with the coronavirus. Um, the Actors Benevolent Fund is is huge in the states. The Actors Fund, um, which uh, has tens of millions of dollars um, operating budget per year. As I said, and they, have, they pay staff, they have uh, major fundraising um, campaign directors, but uh, we are a much smaller organisation in Australia. Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide uh, and Perth um, uh, are the main funds that, uh, that do distribute. So we will be doing whatever we can uh, and we will keep people posted about um, how we can assist performers in need. That's great. And um, look, I think if anything has been learnt from the bushfire appeal, we need to be careful where we put our money. We want to give, but we need to be very clear about who we give it to and how it gets given to those people in need. So one of the benefits of what might come out of this is how we could use a trusted fund that goes directly to the artists and what their campaign looks like. So go slowly and we'll figure out how we do it and we'll do it properly. Thank you so much, Paul. And just visit our website too because you'll find out a lot more about it how you can donate and how you can benefit. Wonderful, thank you so much. And um, our final update will be from Tanya Hall from Arts Queensland. Um, obviously, again, just reminding everyone that this is an evolving situation. There's lots of layers to this uh, and Tanya is here to give us an update as best as she can. And I think also would appreciate and is looking forward to that strategy session after this so she can hear from you and us as a sector and come back and start building some new ideas. So thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Seha. I'd like to echo all of the thoughts and observations from the speakers before me in relation to um, the current situation and the impact it's having on arts and culture sector across Queensland and Australia as well, but particularly Queensland, and also the need for that collaboration across all levels of government as well as across the sector towards some creative solutions. We're certainly uh, very cognisant of um, the workers in the arts and cultural sector and their vulnerability um, considering the amount of workers who are relying on casual or contract-based employment that's very much at the forefront. We're also um, very um, concerned and um, focused on public health and safety, and that's certainly the Queensland Government's number one priority, as you'd be aware. Uh, Queensland Health are the lead agency for this particular situation across Queensland. Arts Queensland has been uh, meeting regularly with a variety of uh, different stakeholders that we fund on all levels across the uh, sector to really understand the immediate impact as well as um, gain that da data that we can understand the short long-term uh, impact that this situation may have on organisations and artists. Those conversations have certainly been helpful because we are working hard on a, a raft of um, initiatives to be able to support the sector. And as Zohar has mentioned today, that's why I'm here. I'm interested to hear your experiences and, and solutions that you may have because that will feed into the process. And we hope, we hope to have those announcements coming shortly as well. Um, immediately from a small to medium sector, I can let you know that there's certainly um, opportunity for um, reporting milestones to be pushed back to enable you to be focusing on uh, your business and staffing and the changing situation as required. Um, for those who are current recipients of project funding through things like QWASP, uh, Individuals Fund or PQF, we'd love to talk to you about um, how you think that you can uh, change and vary your project, if it's timelines, if it's delivery method, if it's changing the activity. I encourage you to be in contact with Arts Queensland to talk to us about how we can, how you want to change it, and it's a very simple process to be able to vary your uh, contract associated with that um, project funding. So please be in touch. But I'm not going to keep talking. I really, actually, do 
I want to throw it out to um, uh, the next half hour to be able to hear the solutions so that can help feed into the um, constant work that we are currently doing around the initiatives to support the sector. That's great. Thank you so much. So let me just talk you through what's happening next. We've got a dedicated 10, 15 minutes of direct questions for those of you that do have unanswered queries about what you've just been updated with. Um, and Sandra Fields is going to facilitate that with Charlie Cush. There'll be a microphone coming around the room. We've also got the fabulous Senya Simic managing our online live streaming. So if you are listening in online, we will try our best to get to you. Uh, this is not our core business, but we are winging it and trying it out. Um, and obviously, we will keep those questions. We are taking notes. If anything goes unanswered, it would just be unanswered for now, and we will ensure that those questions get forwarded on, and if they get responded to, that would be great. Um, so let's get started. I'd like to introduce everyone to my co-pilot and friend, Sandra Field. Thank you. Um, so, um, thank you, everybody, for um, your great insights um, around what's happening at the moment. This, this section is going to happen in two parts. Ladder there. Yeah. Clearly, I'm not from the performing arts. Um, so, uh, there's two parts to this section. One is uh, questions, and it's about questions of clarification. So, of the speakers, including Wendy, uh, uh, if you can ask your question directed specifically to a person and try to keep it fairly punchy. We're going to do this for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to move into right, so what's going on? And what are some of our ideas um, that we have that we can work together on to get through this um, little bit of uh, hiccup um, and so that we can come out uh, the other side quite well. So over to the floor online uh, and in the room for questions. So if you can say who you are, where you're from, if you want to say you're from somewhere and direct your questions to one of um, our panel members. And Charlie, preferably, starts over that side and the next question over this side. <laughs> so Charlie has to run. Also, to be clear with the hygiene, um, if you just speak to Charlie and ask, tell him your question, he will then speak it into the microphone so we're not sharing around the mic. Okay, start thinking of the next question and try and keep it punchy because see what happens. Yeah. So we've been, we're producers of Made Contact or crew have made contact, we've been in negotiations uh, production by production, which is what most of my last two days has been. Uh, for those at the moment, I'm the National Acting Screen Director, so it is my area. Uh, what we're saying to our members in particular, but it's for freelance crew, if you are in a production that is being stood down, um, hiatus, conversations about pushing back, then you need to let us know. Um, so that we can be in there. Uh, we've actually said that we're production... We, basically, we're saying to the industry that the best practice is that we need to work together to get uh, technicians paid, particularly if it, what's being looked at is a hiatus. So at the moment, a, the screen industry is a workplace, not a community gathering. So not it doesn't actually come in under those rules. So what we would be looking at there is being able to have the conversation. So. For instance, there are some areas of the industry where there are large film crews on large film sets who are still at work. What becomes important for them is being about their workplace health and safety. So it's depending on where the level is and where people are at, but it's about having that collective conversation and what does the future look like. And as everyone has said, this is a rolling feast. We don't know day to day what it looks like, but we need to be aware of what it means and at the moment in the film industry you are in so where the knock-on effect is happening is the ability to travel people internationally because often <coughs> film projects have an international component to them 
Um, there may be also about the uh, uh, investors feeling a little bit nervous. So there's a whole range of issues that are occurring, but unless we're having those conversations, we can't ensure that workers have a voice at all. Great. Okay, uh, next question is for Tanya. Um, it's coming from people watching at home. Um, uh, questions around uh, for small to medium organisational fund applications, will there be any consideration around flexibility of application dates? Uh, we're looking at all of our funds across um, those ones who are actually open for applications such as that as part of um, our response to this through our initiatives so that we'll certainly be able to make, make announcements shortly in relation to that flexibility around that. Thank you. Thank you. And I had the next question and it was exactly the same. So there you go. <laughs> uh, questions from the floor? Yeah, Joe. Okay, I'm going to take this one. Okay, you do that too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this is Naomi. Um, she has a question about, is there a central place where all of the information and data is being collected into one place, like in the music industry, I lost my gig, dot com, dot au, dot net, dot net, dot net. So they're saying $100 million in the last 48 hours has been lost. And so the issue here is um, if there's lots of people collecting information from different sources, how is it being coordinated to get um, to one? I'll, I'll have a crack yeah. at the first one. Um, Naomi, to get to get the size of what's going on, LPA has been working with a whole lot of um, a lot of the music promoters are actually members, and so LPA is certainly collating that and putting numbers um, to the federal cabinet to so that they can get the understanding of what what that is. So if you if you want an idea of that, I, I'm not sure if that's on the LPA website, but um, you could certainly go in there and ask the question because they are collating that and pushing that through. And so where can organisations submit their figures? Um, so it depends on the... So Lost My Gig, as Naomi's pointed out, is more for musicians. The one that I referenced, which you can get off the MIA website, is actually collecting it from an organisational point of view as well as an individual point of view. SPA, LPA and MIA, as far as that representation, we're sharing that information. Like, it's not... Like, this is actually about the human picture and the human story of what this is costing. Um, so... I can't recommend highly enough. The, the survey that's on the MIA website is about the impact on the, the individuals but the creative industry. So it's, it might be that you do um, performance for children's parties, that the parties are being cancelled. We need to know that. Like, this is so much bigger than just our venues being closed. Yeah. Mm. So for actors, it's MIA.org is the way, is a place to go. And from Arts Queensland's point of view, um, with organisations um, that are funded through Arts Queensland, that the information that we've been um, provided by all of those organisations certainly help us in that assessment and impact. And I know that um, OSCO also do similar with the organisations that they fund and, and they do reach out to um, jurisdictions. We're all working together to be able to fully understand the whole impact. Um, just a question that's come from online, and maybe, Wendy, this is one for you. It speaks to what John was talking about earlier, about the um, uncertainty around insurances when decisions are not concrete, they're not directives. Um, and so just the query, that um, more of a call, actually, it's a question, is around advocacy to the federal government around making decisions around further um, directives and making them super clear and with very specific timeframes. Um, because that uncertainty that was referenced by John before is what's causing a lot of um, heartache and frustration in the industry. Thanks, Charlie. I think that was something, that was a message that was certainly broadcast loud and clear at the roundtable this morning. Um, that clarity of the directives and, you know, because it makes all the difference for insurance claims, as was raised earlier today. But also, um, the the other thing that people are, are really seeking on is it's, it's all very well to put a you know, a temporary closure, but we need to say for how long that is because people need to plan accordingly. And even if you're going to model what's the impact of modeling for, you know, two weeks versus three months versus six months is going to drastically affect the kinds of um, support that's going to be required. So that is an, another piece which I think um, was made really clear to the Minister this morning at the round table and um, 
which, which has been great. And LPA have been fantastic in their advocacy on this, I need to say. They've been really, really clear and, and doing some great work. Cool. And one more from Michael, I'm asking on behalf of independent actors in a workplace for Michelle. Um, just talk to the workplace health and safety rights of an actor who find themselves in a workplace where COVID-19 is viewed and sort of identifying a hazard, removing themselves from an unsafe situation. Is so one of the things that we're saying for all, like it doesn't matter whether you're a performer or just a general member of the public, the Queensland Health website should be your go-to point in relation to COVID. Um, one of the hot spots in a um, workplace for us in, is that we often have catering in our, web, in our worksites. Um, or communal eating areas. Um, and where catering is provided, then it's often buffet style. So, like, it's simple things like ensuring that it's a food and, food and beverage handling person who's delivering the food to the plate. But it's also around... So we know that wearing a mask on a healthy person isn't really going to limit the transmission of it. But for makeup artists, one of the things that they want to see is... Uh, one of the things that the makeup artists want to see is surgical grade gloves so that they can still feel, but they can have their hands protected so that they can remove the hands because they're transferring between different people. Um, it's about the conversation. So realistically, it's around where is the hand cleaning provided? Where is the hand sanitising provided? What are the expectations and how are we ensuring? So on a large film set at the moment, they might have a meeting. Now, a heads of a department meeting can be a large meeting on a film. They're actually using their video technology, so they're using Zoom to be able to do that. Why are they doing that? Because they're limiting that personal contact. So for me, it's about your hygiene, ensuring that you have access to it and that the what you need is provided, um, and actually reading those guidelines and then just asking the questions. Um, I have another question here um, from Joe at Metro Arts um, to both uh, either Wendy or Tanya. Um, we've seen announcements from both state and federal governments about um, interest-free loans for organisations, but this is more directed at interest-free loans for individuals or a version of um, the dole available for freelancers, independent artists uh, to help get through this period. And available quickly was the sentiment at the end. Uh, is, are we aware of any plans? We've seen those announcements around um, small businesses, particularly businesses that employ people. Um, is, are we aware of any e either policy, new plans or advocacy at the moment to um, create similar opportunities for individuals, particularly artists, particularly quickly? Um, I think uh, earlier today the state government announced um, a, a couple of initiatives mainly directed to uh, small business, um, largely around um, uh, payroll tax deferral, but also a small loan of approximately, I think, $25,000. So it suggests that you um, look into the small business aspect that's been announced from the state government. From an individual's perspective, and particularly artists, there has been uh, no announcements yet in relation to loan, small loans at that point. So Zohar and I just had a quick conversation about that. That, mm -hmm. that might be one of the things yep. that we put up in the next... Um, part. I've got a question here, um, which I've, oh no, I've got this one behind, from okay. Vanessa. Um, so there's been um, obviously some monitoring about the impact on this industry around COVID-19. Is anybody aware, so it's to the broader panel, panel is anybody aware of um, how uh, things are being monitored for the community uh, who are intending to go to a performance or a show and they're not able to do that now and it's changing their lives fairly significantly. Is any, anybody monitoring that? That might be a question for the panel and other people might know the answer to that. It, it's That's in, a it's interesting question. Yeah, yeah I know, nice one, Vanessa. Because um, it actually goes to that value that you all yeah. have um, to community, and yeah. actually it's a really important one for I us to be monitoring. I think we're 72 hours in. Yeah. yeah. Um, and our impact at the moment is on the individuals of yeah. the artistic creatives. Um, I think it's actually at the value of Arts Matters, yeah. and it will be something that needs to be, but at 72 hours in... It's more about the practitioners yeah. and the technicians and our industry's ability to survive. Um, such a great loss. So I think it's one of those that needs to go up on the board in this next 30 minutes about how do we actually make that connection. 
I'm here. Um, uh, so throwing back to your question from online before I get to Lynn's question. Um, it was uh, one to the entire panel. Uh, what are we doing as a sector to support um, Australia's First Nations people who are particularly um, vulnerable in this period? Any other panelists? Wendy, do you want Wendy's to go? Because I feel like I keep talking. I don't <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there's been... There were a number of First Nations arts organisations represented this morning, and I think the reality of what it means for a remote communities. Our Minister for the Arts is very he's, he's very focused on First Nations arts and culture at the moment. So this is this is incredibly helpful because he's been thinking actively about for the art centres that have lost um, the capacity to, to earn income for the artists who will not be earning income immediately. And then also the risks of transmission for those uh, communities are, are far greater than a lot of the metro centres as well. So there's been quite a few actions around what that's going to be. And it's been identified as one of the critical issues um, for the support measures going forward. Um, also in response to that, just to add, um, I've just read an email that's just come through, which was suggested by our dear friends and colleagues over at Black Dance, whether um, there'd be, and we should be trying a First Nations-led approach. Um, and it would be really great to just add that to the board about how we approach this as a sector and it being First Nations-led. Um, can I just add what that was about? Um, that was the Deputy Premier um, asking about um, what collectively the industry is doing about casuals. And so she's going to actually issue a directive in Parliament tomorrow that will encourage, but could go further than that for some people, to make sure that all regular payments for casuals and regular suppliers are met. So I, I think that's a bit of good news in terms of, and we'll hear that, um, uh, she'll, she'll actually say that in Parliament tomorrow. Um, and I actually would like to say, John, that QPAC has been a leader in our industry nationally um, and we should be very thankful. Like one of the reasons in the first 72 hours that we don't have artists who have been employed by um, the large organisations not paid is because QPAC is leading the way and we need to be really um, thankful to John for his advocacy in that and that his position within LPA means that that has spread further than just our state. Um, so I, I just might take the opportunity because what this has come up on the board while you're out, John, and it, and it throws back to Joe's question earlier about um, those independent artists who artists who aren't casually employed. Is the do you know if the intention for the deputy premier is to be thinking about that as well? Um, I'm not sure if it covers that, mm -hmm. right? But what I was hoping that we'd get into the planning session is to go, what is it that we can collectively yeah. do? What opportunities can we create in the tight context we're in? to be able to, um, but, you know, like everything that, that Tanya said, Michelle said, Paul said, we all feed off each other. You know, it's an ecology and we need to support each other. I've got, I just have, I think, one more question. Uh, I've, got, I've got two in my hand, so okay. I should acknowledge I pay homage to those two. So one from Liam from Inside Outside Theatre Company asking a question. Uh, there are some performances still going ahead. What steps can those companies that are still performing take to ensure that their audiences and their artists are safe? current environment. Um. Um, I saw something on Facebook and I know everything that you see on Facebook is not real but I really liked this because it was um, something that I'm not okay with, the chaz hands um, and the air kisses and reminding our audiences of that. So we love that our audiences love us but we need to be safe. Um, it's also about making sure that we have people who are ha having space between each other. That's one of the main things that's on the public health. So I think we need to ensure that we... Uh, Queensland Health is doing a great job. Go to their website, read it. It tells you it tells you what those minimums are, making sure that you've got, you know, hand sanitizer as people are coming in. Um, but we just have to remind ourselves, like, we are the worst at not touching each other, like, as in <laughs> greeting each other by shaking hands or patting each other on the shoulder. And it's a new world for us as well. Um, yes, <laughs> um, yourself, but one of the it. things that, you know, it's about is the jazz hands, the air kisses from one and a half metres um, and, you know, type, tapping elbows and toes. Um, you know, we could make it a dance. It could be our new thing. Mm. We talked about the other day and um, as well, just to, on that, um, 
there's a whole range of stuff that has gone through US and Canada, particularly with closures of theatres there, and a theatre communications group, was it John? Um, that have a great webinar that talks about practical steps that theatres can take while still delivering stuff safely. Um, there's last two questions, Fieldsy. Um, one uh, came through online from Bridget Boyle, was in regards, and Wendy, maybe you can uh, speak to this. Um, can you confirm or deny that uh, sole traders are eligible for the current funding that has been announced? Or maybe it's a state question. Um, I feel like we've spoken through some of those answers and articulated that it's small businesses, uh, sole traders included in that. Can anyone clarify? I'm sorry, I can't clarify that, um, but I'm sure the detail will be available okay. through the, the so um, likewise, official like, panel. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I and so therefore, I guess the follow-up statement would be, can we agitate, advocate for yeah. um, sole traders to be included in that? Last question, Philzy, um, uh, from Adam. So, we, uh, Wendy, with OSCO multi-year funding currently in development for 2021 to 2024, does COVID-19 change how this pool of funding might be distributed? That's a, it's a really big question and one of the many things that we are uh, working through at the moment. We will have, um, the short answer is that we will be putting out information about this towards the end of the week. We are still working through it, um, but of course it does. Uh, when we were going through the process of assessing the four-year funding, this COVID wasn't a thing, and now it's a thing. Um, and it, is, it casts a completely different uh, situation for the sector writ large um, and around issues of sustainability and continuity and so on. So uh, there's a lot going on in that space. I wish I could tell you more right now, but we will be talking to you before the end of the week. Thank you. And just to reiterate, I think everyone here is very grateful and aware at how evolving and how fast paced this situation is. And for government representatives like Arts Queensland and OSCO, we understand that there is no immediate directive as there is no general immediate directive. So uh, we're all in this together as frustrating and as frightening as it can be. And I think uh, at times I'm one of these people I need to slow down. Um, and we accept that this will take a little bit of time. So knowing that there will be further statements at the end of the week is a really heartening thing. Um, and we understand that today they are not available. So thank you. Uh, we realise we could put it forward as an idea as part of the next bit. So we've, um, we kind of were going to like five, maybe quarter past. So really it's going to be five. Um, this is the bit where you get to go I think this is a problem or an issue that we really need to have a look at together. Um, and I think this might be an idea or a solution to address that. So ideally, you would be able to go, I think this is an issue and I think this might be a solution. Or you might go, I've got no clue about what the solution might be, but I think this is a really big thing for our industry. Um, and then we'll open it to the floor about potential solutions. I expect, like normally we might spend half a day doing this together and we've got about 15 minutes. Um, I expect that probably what will happen is that this will spark some connections across the room um, and there might be a couple of things that people might want to work together on in the virtual space to help move forward or to work together with some of um, uh, the industry leaders or um, industry bodies. Okay, over. Uh, I can just start with one that came through from Kate Eltham, uh, the Centre Todd, was um, we, we've heard from both state and federal um, arts agencies is that there is flexibility around grants that are available at the moment. Um, once contracted, funded organisations, if they could unlock seven-year funding in the first year to help weather the short-term storm, that's a um, request to be considered as part of that flexibility. So not an increase to the funding pool, but an access to funding in out years would help get through the short term. If that could be taken on board, that would be fantastic. Has anyone else got any chunky challenges and fantastic ideas? Any challenge? And maybe whilst that conversation is happening, if anybody else has an idea, I'll go and speak to you next. So, um, uh, question probably both again for Tanya and Wendy. 
Um, so representing a company that's about to go out on a four month tour, that tour is now in jeopardy because of the situation they find themselves in. With the sentiment of flexibility around funds, how can we support the artists who would have been out on that tour through that fund, through the grant allocation for working remotely, I'm ad-libbing a bit here, but creative development for future work, um, severance pay for those artists who aren't employed. Is that um, the point? Uh, is, is there any possibility for finding um, stimulus grants specifically that are fast turnaround that we can keep artists employed in Brisbane right now creating new works remotely? Great idea. <clears throat> so, in terms of a new initiative as, as opposed to... Yeah, so sorry, I think not, I, yeah. I gave my version of pennies okay, that's and that's okay. why I gave her the mic. I don't know if you're already in a funded project. Because I was going to say, you're in a funded... If you've got, if you've yeah. got a... Um, so, currently, as I indicated earlier, if you, um, you're a recipient of current funding through COSP or PQF um, and you need to change the, the activity, the timelines or anything, uh, I encourage you to, to contact Arts Queensland and we can talk you through in terms of how you can submit that. Um, variation, no problem at all. That's um, that's fine, and um, th we're certainly looking at um, initiatives to be able to support. So that's a great um, suggestion to be able to come through, and we can certainly feed that into the processes that we're currently working through the initiatives that we're working on. That's a great idea. Okay. Um, I've got one at the back from Nick, which I was hoping that Charlie would get all the ones at the high end. Um, so Nick is from the Dead um, Puppet Society. And we were just talking about the ethics of um, you've got a booking, um, there's a deposit that's been paid and they want their deposit back, i.e. in the education sector. Um, is anybody else experiencing that? And is, does anybody have any solutions around that? Or is there some can industry you, standard? Could that you refine could... the question? I can put my other hat on because I might be able to help. Yeah, okay. So, um, Nick, yell that out. Yeah. I'd feel quite comfortable if you were to... You're asking... So Dead Puppet Society, for example, is asking a school to say, we've paid a deposit, can we have it back? Other okay. way around. Um, what, what, I, what I would do... What I would do if I was you, and this is not advice, but if I were in that situation, I'd go, well, at the moment, we can't really transact that because of the COVID thing, but have you considered postponing it so that you don't lose the work, you just put it in the future? So... I, so, so, so you still secure the work. But, yeah. But it, now, it, if you can't do that it's a, and a cash flow issue, that might be something different. Yeah, so that speaks to... So, um, uh, and for those who are at home and couldn't hear um, their puppets, next question. Um, uh, Clint was saying something very similar here. So, um, freelance performer who's had four months' worth of work cancelled uh, in a very short period of time, that all of those uh, performances put together equates to $46,000 worth of lost income in four days. Um, again, really pushing the sentiment that freelancers in this position are uh, supremely vulnerable and the level of advocacy required to provide support. Um, on behalf of those freelance performers. And we're not the only ones. There's, I've had conversations, about 15 conversations with other freelance entities that are uh, roving entertainment performers. And festivals are cancelling all the way through to December. Um, and we're going to Centrelink tomorrow to try and go, we're going to have to take a break from the arts for the next eight months. Um, um, Michelle, Michelle will be better with, at this than me. But I would imagine if you've got a contract in place, right? Yep, so, yeah, so yeah, I've had lots that, of conversations. That, then, then I'm not sure, with goodwill, that the money instantly disappears, right? <laughs> I can counter that. <laughs> but, but, but that's what I'd be arguing. I'd, I, you know, like, I'd be going back and saying, well, you know, in good faith, we're all in this together. Um, isn't there a precedent where you have to actually pay part of it out? 
Uh, depends on what's in the contract. Yeah. 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 There's um, force majeure clause. Yeah, I contact yeah, but, the but, industrial but, but team. But it may not yeah. be. Like, you know, like, don't give up on this. Like, quite often, right, there's a set of circumstances that happen for a force majeure to be enacted. Now, if it's a festival, Charlie's Festival, for example, we'll just use you for an example, Charlie. Yeah, that's right. The, the festival hasn't cancelled, and it may be shrinking its footprint, but it would not have cancelled because um, it's got obligations that it's got to meet. So um, th there's a difference between panic, you know, from organisations and good business practice. And I think you're in your well within your um, rights to actually go back and go, can we talk this out? Um, so I think there's two different levels in there. Um, I think uh, in relation to Nick's response, can we add to the board that Arts Queensland makes representation to state schools who may have employed um, and asked that they think about, that they see that their investment is a postponement, not a require the deposit back, because that is crippling our industry. Mm -hmm. um, in relation to, there are two different types of cancellation. There are what John referred to, which is panic, um, and we're not actually cancelling, we just don't know if we can go ahead. And then there are Blues Fest. Um, so realistically, if you're a MIA member, you need to contact us. It's about what's in your contract. Um, and our industrial team has been well briefed recently uh, to ensure that they understand, but there are some certain things, but we can have a chat afterwards, Clean. Michelle, if somebody's not a member, can join. they still get advice? Or join if they now. quickly join, can they get advice? People should you should you should always be a member of your industrial oh, organisation. Have you got membership forms money. here today as well? <laughs> um, can I can I just add? Sorry, yeah, just membership's a, not as expensive as you think. Come and see Nico and I at the end. This is just a solution. So this isn't a problem. Just something to add to the board. Another text message from Black Dance saying that the staff have actually developed an Indigenous risk assessment tool today that they would be very happy to share, as the likelihood and consequence for First Nations peoples is higher in terms of transmitting and contracting COVID-19. So I'll work with them in making that resource available. Thank you, Black Dance. I've got two comments just while we're doing that, and I'll come to you, Natalie. Um, uh, so just to comment around postponement doesn't equate to paid employment now for artists, and just uh, a, valid, a valid point made. Um, the other was around um, how we've seen a number of artists from Liesl, um around a number of artists uh, and arts workers looking to package up activities that they can do in isolation. Um, and I think we've seen some fantastic um, initiatives through pub choir doing couch choir, I think Narita Waters and doing the um, her dance program um, from from homes is a part of it. But also there's a question, um, as a freelancer who doesn't have access to Zoom, are there platforms that can become available, how to access um, online digital platforms they don't currently have access to? And is an industry providing those free of charge or um, uh, to, to the sector is a request there. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, any... So can I, I, I'm really not a good techno person, right? But here's my thing. I love Zoom because it's actually an online accessibility. It's not a bought app. Um, so effectively, you don't have to have, have the app to be able to access it. So I, if it's that you're talking more about streaming to 100 people, then maybe that is a purchase. But for small, intimate, Zoom works very well and it's quite reliable and you can share screens so that you can actually have creative whiteboard happening in a, in a um, kind of virtual way. Question no. was, do you need an account for Zoom or does it cost? Some people are saying you do and some can people I, are saying It not. depends what you're doing on it. So if I've set up a Zoom and I've... I've so uh, obviously at my end, I am an applicant who... Ha I am somebody who owns or who has paid for Zoom. You as a participant don't need to pay to be able to be part of that hundred odd people that are on the Zoom that's on my account. If you are an individual who wants the acts to be able to send out you as the invitee to a hundred people, then you will need to pay for it. Thank you. Just, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. And up for, uh, it's free um, up to a hundred and it's also free up to an hour. So you can't, um, if I wasn't paying, then I can't organise a Zoom for more than an hour. Um, but I have, I pay, if you, you know, email me and I'll give you my password. 
Um, oh, don't put that on. Oh. It's too late. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, Phil. Just pretending. Are you going? Yeah, just I just. We love each other. I just, I just to note, I just wanted to list a couple more solutions, which was part of what this session was about. This is particular in sole traders' support. So the sole trader pulls together a list of contracts that were in negotiation or approved or cancelled, the engagement length, type, the partner, and the income loss. Um, the sole trader does an estimation of the other work that they were proposing to secure um, and has not happened due to COVID-19. The sole trader provides their previous tax return and indicates what type of business they run for the ATO and then the MEAA and LPA lobby for a basic livable wage to get us through this time. Um, <laughs> thank you, Fee McDonald. Um, also, just acknowledging we've got Mike with us for another three minutes. So, uh, for those of you who are streaming online or have a requirement for Auslan, just to let you know that we may continue. Um, and we deeply are very grateful for Mike to be with us today and to make this available. You might remember him from such festivals as Perth Festival with the ACDC <laughs> Highway Gig, and we're thrilled to have him with us. So, thank you so much, Mike. Okay, so quick solutions. Also, so again, uh, Kate Elfin sending one through. Um, focusing on any grants at the moment really being pushed towards creative development. Um, and there's a general sentiment around using this period of taking money that would have been spent on performance and pushing it into creative development, providing spaces, other resources that aren't necessarily project grants, but how can we use this period of downtime, lack of performance to really help support um, uh, creative. Uh, creation. Uh, there was a um, query that uh, talking about if we're moving into a digital age, then larger organisations um, funding artists for creation of online content as another solution. Um, I've got a question that I will throw out there for the panel while we take two more here, and then one more there. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Um, and uh, the query was around, and it came back to that. I think some of the concern or the confusion around. If we now have a clear edict that says 500 or more is not allowed, those venues or um, festivals that are cancelling less than 500, um, there's some level of confusion around that. So, um, and that's what's probably causing some of these uh, performances as well, where uh, that are being cancelled, freelancers losing work, then are the festivals or the venues in a position to cancel that if the current directive is around 500? Or more. Anyone else want to take I, that? I was just going to say, um, historically or not historically, but around the world at the moment, those numbers are going to come way low, way below that. In fact, there's two venues in Sydney, one's a 100-seater, one's a 60-seater. They're already talking about cancelling, having to cancel as well. Whether that's their own um, decision to do that for health reasons or whether that will become a directive is unknown, but that's, that's the way it's going to head. So this figure of, you know, this magical figure of 500 people is is really something that's... The, the, know, five, the 500 was based on... Um, all, all this is based on a whole lot of um, um, health, world health modelling, and each country's taken their own. And at the moment, the strategy in Australia is containment, and it's at 500. But those of you who would have heard the, the Up With Sparrows this morning, like me, listening to Donald Trump, because that's my favourite thing to do, um, <laughs> it's, it's down to 10. Yesterday, Canada was at 50, right? And we've got an international partnership with a large French company, as you know, and they look like they've been um, told to stay indoors. So, you know, if we were to bring that company, you know, um, we're going to have to quarantine them for two weeks and then quarantine them on the way back. So you can see where that's going. Like, to, for us to take on the cost of, a, of 160 people um, to quarantine them for a month where we get no income, we'll postpone that. You know, that, that's... That's where we're heading with that. So I, I'm not sure how much certainty we can give around lot of performances at what number. But just to say, you know, that tonight's performance of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory will be in John's lounge room. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll be playing Charlie as well. <laughs> <laughs> Can't well, wait. We'll <laughs> um, uh, I've got a few that I'm trying to remember and keep in my head uh, once. Uh, Caitlin put the recommendation forward saying there's a, um, there is a bunch of freelancers in the room who would love to have some database or somewhere they can sign up for to say, hey, I'm around now and available and willing to do certain types of work. And so it's like almost like an Airtasker kind of database. Well, saying, they're actually, they've started one on Facebook today called Arts Tasker. 
So there you go. go on if you're not on Facebook and look at that. Now, if you've got other skills that aren't arts related, babysitting, dog walking, money laundering, whatever, um, <laughs> go on Arts Tasker. <laughs> and in between. Yep. So just repeating that for people playing at home, Arts Tasker is for arts work. In between is taking your other skills and using those to help generate money for you to pay for your arts side of things. Um, uh, we had a comment here regarding um, payroll tax um, exemption uh, is good for some, but some small to mediums who are charitable organisations don't get the benefit of payroll tax exemption. So again, lobbying to say any other stimulus outside of that, we've seen at a state level that um, loan uh, interest-free loans are one step towards it, but actual stimulus to support the organisations. Do, do I get that? And I oh no, took. Oh yep. Hold on. Okay, so I'll I'll do this one while. Oh, no. Just specifically in terms of supporting these organisations that are advocating on our behalf, is there some kind of like volunteer air tasker where like oh. I'm not doing anything anyway, so I That's could cool. help these organisations that are helping me. That's great, mate. I love that. Much How can better we help you. you? Um, so, and probably um, the really clear part about that is that where where can that happen? Do you need to go to individual organisations, or can it be coordinated somewhere? Might it be anyone's role here, or do we put it up on um, air task and in between? Yeah. I mean, on behalf, like for LPA, for MEAA, for Art Artist Benevolent Fund, do you want people to come direct to you to offer their time as volunteers, Absolutely. stuff envelopes like I used to do when I was 15? Like, what do you need? They don't exist anymore, envelopes, oh. stamps. Fair call. Well, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a question um, from Vanessa, I'll come back and say, around um, so postponing events until the moment a number of festival events are pushing into September and October. Um, is there any level of coordination around festivals, September, um, festivals who are looking at that window of time? Um, or at the moment, is everyone just pushing and holding back until that window um, when we expect things might return to normality? What are you doing then, Charlie? Yeah. September, mate. <laughs> <laughs> at the moment, I mean, to speak on behalf of, the, of one of the big festivals in the room, um, it, it, it's a it's a wait and see. I mean, I really I think it's a difficult one to say um, whether or not I think that those festivals that are falling within the window of organisations that we see with seasons are, are cancelling and working through the ramifications of that. Um, we're in September. Uh, that falls within the six in the three to six months. We're working through our options in that space as well. At the moment, we're planning to deliver our our festival. Um, what Talking to our, across our sector as part of that um, is very important. Working with our colleagues in other festivals, with our artists, with our sponsors, our government partners, we do need to continue to talk. And I think we've heard from a number of panelists that it is about collaboration, and, and we just need to really be clear in our communication around it. So, happy to continue to talk to you, Vanessa, around that as well. And, and probably those smaller festivals, yeah. you know, making because because the date clash will be insignificant. I've got one from behind the board here. And I just need to let Mike know that his time's up, and you've got somewhere to be, mate. So okay. thank you so Thanks, much. <laughs> yeah. What a star. Okay, yeah. um, so it's actually quarter past five, and we this was our um, drop dead time. Um, we've got one statement or question here and then um, one for Beck. Are people happy that we then wrap it up then? And if there's anybody who'd like to have a conversation outside, is the bar open? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry to all of you online. Um, anyway, uh, so the question um, from up here was, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Chloe. So Chloe's a designer. Um, and this is a comment for governments to consider um, that as we... Um, the less clear that we are about closure times, uh, the more difficult it is for those people who are designers um, trying to get um, stages and festival sites, etc., cetera, um, ready. Um, and that um, not knowing, you don't know whether you're getting up and going to work that day um, because everything is so fluid. So um, I'm sure there's a lot of people probably saying the same thing, which is the more definitive that we can be about closure times and who needs to be closed, um, the better. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, so if materials don't need to be bought because it's just not happening, then we need to know. Great. Charlie? Okay, sorry, no, I'm continuing. So, there's a few here. Uh, coming back to Beck's point was around, um, again, a conversation about um, ensuring cash flow for independent artists and just, again, pushing how paramount that is. So, continued income for independents and for artists through this period of time. Um, and then a solution on top of that in regards to um, placemaking, organisations, those who are funded, those who continue to operate in this period of time, engaging artists in their places of business for things like placemaking initiatives, um, in, but providing opportunities for artists in that. Did I get it? Yeah, this is around the whole economy. The, the whole economy is struggling <laughs> and artists have its place. We have a big place to be able to rebuild the economy and to understand our power and our strength in that and start building relationships now with businesses so that we can be part of that rebuilding. And I think we've got to remember how strong we are and what, what value we have. I'll take that as a comment. I'm happy to have this one for the panel. Um, Naomi raised the point around um, mental health for artists in this period. So um, a few parts in that, uh, ensuring that there are resources available for people in isolation or people out of work and that there's support for mental health those who continue to be employed in this period um, to provide opportunity to reach out to the independents, um, make sure that there's an ongoing dialogue and engagement through that, and those in funded organisations about contributing to a Kickstarter or some fund to ensure there's an ongoing level of support uh, for artists in this space. Mm. Okay. Great. Right. No. Sorry. Here's my provocation. Oh, oh. If you, if you, if you're Charlie, on, health and safety, if mate. If you're on a full-time wage and a very healthy one at that, that is so far going to be un unaffected by venue closures, what will you do as an executive, as somebody who is running a funded organisation or is on wage to pledge to help freelancers and independents whose work has completely dried up for the next foreseeable future? And that's, I guess, like two parts as an individual and then also in, uh, as an organisation. And I mean, I think that might be a really good way to um, wrap up this session before I hand it back over to Zoha. And that is that there's that individual responsibility, like what can each of us do? What, how can we help? What can our organisation do? What can the industry do? Um, and, that, and what um, can all of these partners, as John said earlier, that we're all in this together and we've all got different roles to play and it's going to keep changing. Um, I probably have one question for you, Zoha, which is about... So this, I think this has been fantastic, and congratulations uh, to you on making it happen. Um, and so my question is, given that this thing is going to keep evolving, um, uh, how do you um, want to keep the conversation going uh, in a way that makes sense for you? Now, I don't know whether that, you know, this is a suggestion for you to answer, Zoha, or... Yeah, look, I mean, I think the most important thing is about that we are... I mean, the act of hosting this here today at Labwatt was born out of a suggestion from colleagues because it was contextualised that we were hosting Highway. And, of course, we're part of this community, so we step into that space. I think, um, you know... I think the way that we survive this, and it is survival, is around continuing to be community and, and continuing to find ways to commune. Um, if we feel like we need to do this again when we have further information, of course, we've got the benefit of having a smaller size venue. If it stays at 499, we can keep coming back here and we'll, you know, we'll keep trying to do this opportunity to live stream. Um, However you want to communicate, we are absolutely here. Um, and I know our colleagues on this panel, as well as our colleagues across the city and nationally, um, would do the same. So um, after this session, what we had hoped to do was take all of these notes, put them together. There's a few people who have been taking minutes, and this session's been recorded. Um, we'll then share it with everyone that registered. There were nearly 200 people that registered to this event. Um, but there's obviously Facebook groups and a whole range of um, ways that we can share it and uh, come together to advocate. Um, so we'll stay in touch. Um, if there's a need for us to host this event, absolutely we will respond to that. Um, if someone else wants to host it, we can do, we could do it in turns. But it's very clear that we have the complete city, the complete state, as well as the national support for us to keep coming up with solutions. We are an incredibly creative sector. Um, and 
this is what we do, um, but for us to survive this and support one another through it, we need to keep communicating. And self-isolation does not necessarily mean complete isolation. So however you need to get online um, and whatever you need us to do, we are here and that's part of our role as a privileged leader. So. And I just want to say also, um, please go to the Actors Benevolent Fund website and have a look there. There are also lots of industry contacts on that website. There are also lots of self-help um, phone numbers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, if you are struggling with mental health, etc., that you can go to um, as well. But as I said, we'll be having a meeting tomorrow with our um, management committee, and we will be coming up with ways that can help um, this crisis as, as best we can as a small organisation. So, so um, just could I just ask everyone? Honestly, this has been such a mammoth effort on behalf of everyone, the team at La Boite, but also all the people that have freely contributed their time and. Um, their equipment. Thank you, Optical Block, for making this live stream. You are superstars. Uh, um, uh, but also, um, Wendy, thank you so much for joining us online. John, Michelle, Paul, Tanya, thank you. I know that you guys are very busy and at the coalface and responding and to be able to front up and just give us what you can, it's deeply appreciated. Thank you all for being willing and, and taking the risk and communing. Uh, there's, um, yeah, the, the bar is open if you want to continue. Otherwise, feel free to head on home. But we will stay in touch and um, be transparent as things come through. So thank you to Charlie and Sandra, uh, Mike runners and facilitators, and to Sanya for nailing that online beast that we didn't quite know what we were doing when we started. So um, thanks again and um, good luck and stay healthy and we're here if you need. Thank you.